Hello there and welcome to The Understudy. Um, today I am reading part 3 of Freeing the Natural Voice by Kristen Linklater for my own educational purposes, but I'm very happy that you're here to join me. Part 3. The link to text and acting. Words. Imagery. Language began instinctually, physically, primitively. The extended roar of pain, hunger, pleasure, or rage was, over time, articulated into more detailed communication by muscles in the body responding to the demand of a developing body-mind intellect. The brain, needing to convey increasingly precise information, deployed muscles in the mouth to distinguish positive from negative reactions and gradually to describe objects and facts and handle the minute of language. It is inconceivable that when the first mouth first started to make words, it did so in a matter divorced from its familiar exercises of chewing, biting, kissing, sucking, licking, snarling, lip smacking, and lapping. All of these were practical activities, with sensual rewards and palpable side effects of pleasure for most of them, and anger or fear for one or two. Words have a direct line from the nerve endings of the mouth to the sensory and emotional storehouses in the body that include the nerve centers governing appetite. That direct line has been short-circuited over the past three or four hundred years by the exponential growth in, the de in our dependence, first on print and most recently on technology for communication. Whatever the benefits of these modes, they have shifted the bulk of information sharing from the ear to the eye. The eye's initial relationship with information is at a distance, outside the body. The ear, by its anatomical nature, receives information inside the body, allowing internalization more readily. One can say that the eye objectifies while the ear subjectifies. Information that enters orally enters on vibrations that travel into the body. Visual information can bypass physical responses and easily move into the realm of assessment, appreciation, and judgment. Oral, oral communication is the stuff of an actor's life. Listening is lifeblood, oxygen, food, and drink. When the actors listen, they answer from the body-mind. If you have been conscious consciences um, into in following the exercises in this book you have done much to restore direct neurophysiological neuro pathways for the voice to travel through the body arousing physical sensory sensu sensual and emotional response but there is still work to be done to re-establish the visceral connection of words to the body Words have become largely utilitarian in everyday life and are conditioned to run from the speed, speech or cortex straight to the mouth. They seldom pick up an emotional charge, except under extreme provocation. Passionate rage, joy, love, or grief can break through convention and the spark of and spark the ignition of visceral truth. But there is still a vast territory of expression between utility of passion that can profit from visceral connection without waiting for extremity. Awareness of the sensory nature of words must come before that of their informational purpose if we are to restore words to the body. This is not to say that intellect is to be ignored, but that in order to redress the balance between intellect and emotion, emotion must be given precedence of for a little while. For a large part of any day, our voices are programmed to convey information. The dry facts and figures of making appointments, exchanging news, dealing with clients or officials. The shopping list part of the brain that has commandeered language almost entirely to its use, while the emotional and imaginative parts have to struggle for their rights in it. Taking words back to their physical, sensory, and emotional sources is not difficult once a few examples have been given at the guidelines understood. The exercises in this lesson are experimental. They are intended to spark further experiments and fresh ideas, but and must not be seen as rulemaking. Step 1. You will explore the different effects that different vowel sounds can have on your feelings and on your body. The feeling of vowels and consonants reveal subverbal meanings in, word, uh, in words. The feeling of vowels and consonants link us to the desire to communicate. 
The word feeling implies here both physical sensation and emotional effect. Prepare your body to be receiving an instrument, to be a receiving instrument to be played on by the sound. You can lie, sit or stand, but whichever position you start from, you must prepare with deep relaxation that will result in the state of unblocked physical awareness through which vibrations can flow. To begin with, the supine position is the least tense and therefore the most receptive. Center your attention in the solar plexus breathing area. From that area, sigh out a long, easy, ah. Picture the stream of sound flowing from the center of the torso, up through the chest and throat, and out through the mouth, down the arms, out through the hands, down through the stomach, into the legs, and through the feet. Imagine a white stream of ah vibrations as energy that can move your body. Imagine that the electrical impulse for a sound activates your body and voice simultaneously. On each ah, 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 explore the feeling that are aroused by the sound and free those feelings through the sound. Now think the sound e, and feed it down to your central solar plexus diaphragm area. Sigh out e. Let it flow through your torso and your limbs and let it stimulate your body into movement, allowing your body to take in the intrinsic quality of E and find out what differences there are between the mood of ah and the mood of E, whether your body and your feelings reflect those differences. Now go through the same process with ooh as in food. Feed the sounds into the central area, alternating with ah, e, ooh. Change the sequences. Be true to the form of each vowel sound. If you have been experiencing these lying down, repeat the exercises standing so that you let the sounds move your body through space. Step 2. Take three vowel sounds whose quality is intrinsically sharper, shorter, and more staccato than the first three. A as in cat, ah. I as in hit, i, i. U as in cut, uh, uh, a, i, uh. Taking each in turn, drop it into your diaphragm center and bounce it out of you as though your diaphragm were a trampoline. Punch with each sound. Bounce each vowel sound up and down your range. You will find how each makes you feel. Play these short staccato vowels into your body to stimulate movement. It may be that only a small part of your body will be affected by the small sounds. The quality of movement will differ if the quality of I is different from the quality of ah. Step 3. Drop contrasting vowel sounds into your body one after the other to spark contrasting physical and vocal responses. For example, ah, 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 ooh, ee, eh, ah. This is to develop vocal and physical flexibility of response. Vary, with the, vary the rhythm, always observing the contrast between short and long vowels. There exists a very fine line here between a free sound movement response and the imposition of invention on the sound. Invention and creativity with sound belong in another kind of exercise. In this, the objective is to see whether your body and your voice are capable of receiving and realizing fully the innate character of a particular vowel sound. You are imposing your power of invention on sound if, in search of variety, you force ooh to go high and staccato and I to be deep and legato. When the one is intrinsically comfortable in deep resonators and slow, warm movements, the other feels more at home in the upper range while moving your hands and feet. Your variety will be exercised in the wide variety of vowels. I have used as examples only the most obviously contrasting sounds. As you explore the influence on sound and movement by, of subtly, subtly different vowels, uh, you, such as e in bed, e, a in hate, o in hope, a in walk, O in hot, uh, 
you will, if you persever, per persevere, develop the sensitivity of your muscles and resonators so that they will naturally reflect the delicate nuances of color and music that are stuff of that are the stuff of words. Step four. We now we move from the feeling of vowels to the feeling of consonants. Focus your attention into your mouth. Explore the physical sensation of mmm between your lips. Run it high and low, moving your lips. Let the vibrations of M, mm, feed from your lips down to your midsection to find out how you feel as your, as your mouth is used by mm. Now explore mm. Let that consonant tell you its nature. Let that t then let your tongue taste mm, and zzz. Take them long and luxuriously. Picturing a stream of vibrations forming an unbroken connection between the tongue and the upper gum ridge and, sol and the solar plexus center. Play with s and f. These involve breath and no vibrations of sound. They are unvoiced. How do they make you feel? Play with b, d, g voiced and then k, t, p unvoiced. Feel the staccato quality in contrast of the legatos of the M and S. Play with the contrasting staccato and legato consonants. The vibrations of breath will explode from the staccato consonants in an unformed neutral uh, Spoken with the voiced consonant, whispered with the unvoiced. The legatos need no vowel, vowel sound. Example, uppercase letters are voiced, and lowercase letters are unvoiced or whispered. Ba, z. Mm. K. S. T. D. Mm. Make a collection of consonants and develop rhythmic patterns for them. Example. Mm. K. Z. F. T. T. D. Mm. Let a rhythmic pattern of consonants, such as the previous one, move your body. Step 5. Take two contrasting vowel sound feeling qualities and two contrasting consonant sound feeling qualities. For example, and mix them. Let's see, underlined letters, long sounds, idolized letters, short sounds. Ah, elongates the long elongate the long sounds clip the short ones as small as possible improvise with range volume and rhythmic changes on your vowel consonant mixture play these through your body so that they become spoken music activating you to move don't sing this exercise is to expand the potential in your speaking voice let your body feel the different qualities of the sounds and respond to them. Try not to use the sounds to express your energy, but let the sounds use you. On the basis of step 5, explore a mix of three or more contrasting vowels and three or more contrasting consonants. Put them together in clear rhythmic patterns so that they do not become gibberish. Exercise your body and your voice to respond to thought impulses of sound that are free from meaning. Use any combination you can and put together you can put together that moves your mouth and your breath and your body to react with changing energies. It is essential to these sounds and movements explorations that the intrinsic character of different vowels and consonants are not ironed out by their rhythm or subdued by other energies. You will find that as you allow these sounds to play through you, they will stimulate energy by the impact of their vibrations. If your body is relaxed and your mind open, sound will immediately generate energy. It also offers a channel through which you can express pent-up feelings. You must decide whether you are going to use the exercise to release emotions or to stick to the rules of this particular exercise. 
The rules are that the different energies generated by different sounds feed right back into those sounds and serve them. Here is an example of how to illustrate these. Might be a little difficult to listen to. T, E, P, T, A, Z, W, E. This might look roughly like honest Dave. T, E, P, T, A, Z, Z, W, E. If you repeat it several times with rhythm and movement, it might become don't pound it into one note. This must be avoided. Also try to avoid releasing arbitrary excitement on that will send the sounds away from the resonance home. To tune your ear to the built-in music of vowels, whisper them. As you take away from the resonance of your voice, you will clearly hear the pitch changes that occur as the breath passes through your changing mouth shapes. Step 6. Here now is a way to organize the intrinsic music of vowels with the resonating ladder. Vowels and resonance have their homes in the body. This is an energizing warm-up of embodied vowels and consonants. You will be moving through the vowel scale with the different consonant attached to the beginning of each vowel, starting with the lowest and working to up to the highest. Each sound belongs, belongs in a different part of the body, and you should let each sound arouse energy, mood, feeling, or full-blooded emotion, and then activate your body as it goes through you. Use your hands to shape, encourage, stroke, and pummel the sounds from your body, as though your hands too were speaking. Let the zoom travel down into your pelvis and legs, moving you and them. Now imagine a huge mouth opening from your belly and let the sound ooey, whoa, as in whoa, emerge, moving you and the middle of your body. Picture the diaphragm solar plexus attached to the bottom of your rib cage and let out a long drawn shawa. Now put one fist on the center of your chest over the breastbone, the other directly behind it between your shoulder blades. Feel, is, feel as if the sound must break through your bones and let a sharp, strong ga, as in got, burst out. Put both hands on your upper chest and start a long mmm, which opens into a wide, warm ah, as your arms gradually lift out at the sides. Your heart releases its vibrations out through a side, gen wide, generous throat and through the expansion of your arms and hands. Put your fingers on your lips, as if blowing a quick kiss. Let out fa, as in fun. Make it light and airy, fa. Now your hands and mouth are going to release a vague, misty, perhaps rather unsure sound, like a long, unformed sigh. Ah. Next, place your fingers on your cheeks and explode a warm, strong, extrovert B, as in bat, from your lips straight out through the middle of your cheeks. Let it be bright and confident and cheery. From there, move up through to your cheekbones. Let your fingertips be to, to guide your fingertips to the heart resonant cheekbone ridge on either side of the bridge of your nose. Let the blade of your tongue flick the syllable de, as in beck, forward and up, to spring jauntily, carelessly into the air. The upward journey of your thoughts has now reached the level of your eyes. Feel the bone structure circling your eye socket. Picture the portholes of the eyes. Be aware of how fragile your eyes are and the protection that surrounds the windows to the soul. Almost a transparent flow of vibration can steam out at this level on pay, -ay -ay, as in pay, expressing an open vulnerability, perhaps surprise, wonder, innocence, or even panic. Pay! Then take a quick hop up to a pin prick of sound, spitting off the middle of the forehead. Ki, as in kit. The final sound at the top of the scale spirals out 
though through a small hole in the crown of your head, is re. This should lift you off the ground with its sheer ebulli eb ebullient, ebullient energy. It may be silly, ecstatic, thrilling, or thrilling, but it can be hard. But it can hardly be done without you smiling and jumping in the air. Having gone all the way up, go all the way down. Let each sound arouse its different energy and mood. Make sure you allow each sound its true pitch and frequency. Let your breath be free and your spirit, spirit willing to be acted upon. Here is the sequence, bottom to top, then top to bottom. Zuo sha go ma fa ha Ba de pe ki ri ri ki pe de ba ha fa ma go sha wo zu. To begin with, you should allow a new breath impulse for each sound. Sorry, I did not do that. <laughs> as you become familiar with the sequence, you can put together the sound groups as though a sentence, but make sure they are fully embodied in the sound and movement. This scale integrates vowels, resonance, body, and energy should warm you up through a wide spectrum of sounds and pitches. The scale provides an aerobics of the inner self that vitalizes language and brings incarnated life to any text. Step 7. Using steps 1 through 6 as models for anatomizing words, you choose a word that is onomatopoeic and play it into your body, ignoring its sense as much as possible. Example. Splash, ratatad, murmuring, serration, whip. If you were to take the word splash, you might go through the following processes. Feel S in your breath release from your center, hissing the word front, uh, between the front of your tongue and the upper gum ridge. Feel P in the tiny puff of breath exploding from between the wet parts of your lips. P. Feel L as liquid vibration between your tongue and your gum ridge. L. Feel a as in a staccato bouncing, bouncing from the diaphragm, glancing off the roof of the mouth and out into the air. Feel shh in the air, softly foaming out between the middle of the tongue and the roof of the mouth. Then slowly, one by one, with a new breath for each. la shh. Then gradually speed up the sequence until they join together in one breath with physical awareness dominating. Splash. Admit the sense and or picture conjured up by the collection of sounds. Drop the word sense into the center of your body and see what it makes you feel. Let the sense of the word and the vibrations of the word play on you. Explore the sound, the sense, associations and feelings with movement. Step 8. Take a word with a representational picture. Example, wind, butterfly, clouds, sky, earth, stone, rock, brick, sea, waves, stream, river, ocean, fire, flame, blaze, sparks. Close your eyes and to see the picture clearly in your mind's eye. Drop the, pic the image into your solar plexus breathing center. Allow your feelings to respond to the image as breath flies in. Let the feelings find sound. As the sound releases out through your mouth, your lips and tongue mold it into the original word. Let the word serve the image. Let the feeling need the word to express itself. Step 9. Take a word with an emotional image. Example, love, rage, giggle, sorrow. Drop the word deep down into your body and see what happens. If you give yourself time, you may find that associative images grow out of what the word means to you, or that the meaning makes direct contact with your feelings. Again, let your breath emerge with the feelings that flow back out through the word. Step 10. Find words more with more abstract images. 
purple, red, blue, yellow, jagged, round, darting, transitional, whimsy, flimsy, solid. Let these words form their images and associations and feelings in you. Let the feelings be expressed through breath, voice, and the word as you speak it. Step 11. Explore action words. Example, run, subside, explore, live, die, fight, go, fly, murder, comfort, placate. Step 12. Play with small words. For, and, to, it, if, such, now, which, what, how, or, but, against, unless, since. If you give each word time, it will assert its dependent character, which can create its own abstract shape in the mind's eye, normally subdued by the more powerful images to which they are attached in a sentence. Their separate qualities can add nuanced, vivid color to inflection. They have a dramatic influence on thought, opening doors, turning corners, creating or breaking relationships. Step 13. Bringing together a sequence of the words you used in step 8 through 11 in any order without making sense. Butterflies, blue, giggle, murmuring. Exercise your ability to let one image, representational or abstract, follow another in sequence to let feeling flow in response from image to image. You may hear or see the image in your head and beam the image down into your middle. You, or you may directly see the image in the center of your body. One after the other, let each word image feeling find accurate reflection in your voice. Slowly, first, to be sure of precise moment-to-moment -moment connection, then faster, without letting one rob, word rob another of its independent character. For instance, don't let blue color butterflies or giggle affect murmuring. Some make some sense grammatically out of the words. Example, the murmuring blue butterflies giggle. Now, as you put blue and butterflies together, they will form a new image from the separate two. But the composite picture is more powerful by virtue of the strength of the components. Add murmuring to make three make one whole. Mobile picture. The giggle comes in and breaks the picture up, changing the feeling. Example 2. No sense. Blaze ocean ratata ye rage yellow. Grammatical sense. The, rata the ratata ocean blazes into yellow rage. Ocean is one picture. Ratata added to ocean changes the picture. Blaze is one picture. The ocean blaze is a new picture. Rage might be red when it's alone, but has to yield to the yellow rage of the ocean. The point of this exercise is to allow individual words to influence your voice, giving a phrase or sentence more life than just what it gets from the overall sense. The first example has, deliberately, little sense to it, but it does convey information that those butterflies were giggling. The general feeling of the sense is giggly and can be the t one tone to emerge from the sentence. In that case, the fact that they were murmuring and were colored blue could be immaterial. In the second example, the general expression is of anger, but there are descriptive specifics in the picture that can be communicated if the voice is sensitive to the influence of ratatat, yellow, and ocean. Memories of kindergarten spo poetry speaking. The sun in the sky, pointing heavenward with, up, with an upward inflection and the earth is down below. Looking down, dropping the voice, may give one pause. But these exercises are designed to start moving the voice from within, to make it come alive to a sensory and imagistic, an imagis, imagistic inner world. Once it is made flexible and sensitive, you can return to the job of communicating textual sense but with your voice now susceptible to paratextual influences. The extremes of color and image will serve the sense inflection, but sense need no longer be the sole inflection in your speech. About texts, art, some general observations. 
The focus of this book is the voice as an instrument of communication distinct from that of speech. Once the natural voice is free, it will be expanded for artistic potential in all areas. Most theater performances make use of the voice in some way, though there are certainly theater pieces that are more or less, or completely, without words. Contemporary dance theater may be vocal, and puppet theater makes use of extended voice. But both of these are elaborations on the mission of an actor's voice training, which is to bring the text of a play faithfully to life. The ultimate aim of this work is for the voice to be supremely well prepared to translate the written text of a play into spoken language. The actor works on voice and speech as a collaborator in the service of the play. From page to stage is a pithy phase in that is accomplished by transforming a resurrecting and resurrecting the word from dead print to an embodied flesh and blood presence. The etymological, etymological root of the word text is the Latin texere, which means to weave or to fabricate. The word textile comes from the same root. A text is a tapestry of ideas woven with words. The actor must translate the written tapestry into a spoken story through voice, and the art of acting lies in the actor's ability to intuit the feeling behind the idea that is expressed in words. The actor's vocal craft will determine the level of intuitive skill which, with which they can probe the text from the originating feelings. Western theatre is primarily verbal and text-based. In order to fulfill the demands of Western dramatic literature, actors must develop an appetite for language and a wide understanding of texts. In the final pages of this book, I will offer some ideas as to how to approach a text. Text work of this kind is not analytical. It is not the table work that often precedes active rehearsal on a play. It is the actor's private, personal absorption of the words of a play deep into the body-mind where the seeds of meanings can be sown, take root, and grow organically. Out of the intelligence of the body mind spring surprising truths as opposed to as opposed to the more predictable fruits of the rational frontal lobe thinking where decisions are made and results are preconceived and controlled. The Cartesian way of thinking, which has been boiled down to an oversimplified adage of I think therefore I am, has never been convincing to performing artists. It is obvious to those who, of us who work in the psychophysical field that is, it is, I am, therefore I think. Antonio Damasio's book, Descartes' Error, maps the communication routes between the mind and the body and delivers neurobiological proof that being must be the ground for thinking. I have quoted Damasio previously, and I turn again to his second book, the feeling of what happens, as we begin the adventure of language, text, and words. His description of the way language works has an, authentically, has an authenticity and elegance I am unable to emulate. Language, that is, words, sentences, is a translation of something else, a conversion of non-linguistic images, which stand for entities, events, relationships, and interferences. If language operates for the self and for consciousness in the same way that it operates for everything else, that is, by symbolizing in words and sentences what exists in a nonverbal form, then there must be a nonverbal self and a nonverbal knowing for which the words I or me or the phrase I know are the appropriate translations, I in any language. I believe it is legitimate to take the phrase I know and deduce it deduce from it the presence of a nonverbal image of knowing centered on a self that precedes and motivates the, that verbal phrase. The idea that self and consciousness would emerge after language and would be a direct construction of language is not likely to be correct. Language does not come out of nothing. Language gives us names for things. Given our supreme language gift, most of the ingredients of consciousness, from objects to interference, can be translated into language, and for us, at this point in history and the history of each individual, the basic process of consciousness is relentlessly translated by language, covered by it, if you will. Because of this, it does require a major effort to imagine what lies behind language, but the effort must be made. From The Feeling of What Happens by Antonio Damasio, page 107 to 108. 
the mental effort the actor must take in must make in taking the printed word and transforming it into the spoken word is to still the clamor of the irrational brain and give the word time for the image of print to dissolve and transmute into the nonverbal images, feelings, states of beings, desires, and memories that lie beneath. A word or a phrase or a sentence is like a pebble that, when thrown into the pool of the body-mind, sets up ripples that disturb the waters. The waters? Physical, sensory, sensational, sensual, and emotional energies. Then, when the energies become insistent and need to be released, the water turns to vibration and becomes voice. The nonverbal now has access to words, ready-made, retained, and shaped by the brain, but not controlled by it. The voice, works, the voice work you have been doing on your journey through this book prepares you to meet words in this way. Ideally, voice work should be fee should feed organically into acting, speaking a text, or plain speaking, without conscious application of technique. If the work to free the voice has been deeply absorbed, the person will be naturally freer. The person and the voice will have become unified. In many instances, a natural connection happens. Someone will go from a voice class to an acting class and experience a totally new freedom that is only partly to do with the voice. It might seem superfluous to mention the advantage of doing a warm-up before going on stage or into rehearsal. But there are actors who are still surprised at how well a rehearsal or performance went after having done a voice workout. It should also be said that the majority of serious actors always warm up physically and vocally for up to an hour before every performance. Only gifted except exceptions can walk in off the street and onto the stage and give an electrifying performance with no preparation. No young actor should make them exemplars. The aim of the warm-up is not just to produce a well-tuned instrument, but to reopen the road leading into and out of the creative sources. When an acting moment hits the pay dirt of truth, voice and words know how to behave. Contemporary acting training uses exercises and improvisations to guide, shake, or trick the students into a nonverbal, instinct based state of being where impulses are generated and acted upon without thinking about them. Genuine states of being can be experienced. The routes to them are gradually familiarized and a craft developed that takes some of the haphazardness out of the creative process. However, an actor needs as many keys to the truth as possible, and knowing how to read a text in depth and connect language with breath and voice will improve a golden key to hang on the chain of craft. A continuing theme in the voice work throughout this book has been the use of images. There have been accurate anatomical images and specific imaginative images. The central nervous system governs the whole organism through continuous streams of images, be they auditory, olfactory, tactile, visual, impressionistic, or figurative. The images in stock work help to reconnect the acts of listening and speaking to the whole organism. Listening is no longer attached just to the ear. Speaking no longer suffers under the dictatorship of the mouth. Embodied listening and speaking involves the whole person, person from feet to skull. The body is all ears. The body is one big mouth. From this ground of experience, we can devise processes that accelerate our entry into the understanding of a text. The intelligence of the whole body is infinitely greater than the intelligence of the frontal lobes, and when the word becomes flesh, the speaker is led to the threshold of understanding. The Welsh poet Gwyneth Lewis said, the way for me, forward for me in using a different part of myself to judge between true and false. The best way I can describe it is moving down from my head and into my stomach. The head is where all our fancies, recollections, gripes and projections are endlessly rehearsed. It's a virtual reality gallery dedicated to your personal preoccupations. Although the pictures are vivid, no, compelling, this area has no way of distinguishing between fantasy and truth, because both look just as convincing. The head, then, is very good at trying out possibilities, versions of reality, and totally unable to make moral choices between them. The stomach does not, doesn't work visually, but visu visually, visually. 
it sees in the dark, but if you listen carefully, gives reliable guidance. It ties itself knots when you're lying and tells you what to do even before you have worked out why that should be right. Like a dog, it is instinctive in its likes and dislikes and its decisions are invariably sound. The head tells you what could be. The stomach tells you what is. When you're used to leading your life with your head, it is hard to move down and learn to see with another part of yourself. But the insights that come with the effort to do so are startling. From Sunbathing in the Rain, a cheerful book about depression by Gwyneth Lewis, page 233. When you're used to leading your life with your head, you also probably are used to reading a text with your head. Even those who live with more stomach-centered lives nonetheless read with their heads, thinking of texts as somehow separate from life. Moving down into the stomach and lower in order to read will reward you with all sorts of insights. In addition to voice work, whatever acting techniques have been developed by the actor for his or her personal approach to this multifaceted art, I would like to offer some simple techniques designed specifically for delving into the text itself. Some general ideas and ways of approaching the text. Reading with the head, the linear habit. I invite you to enter a test to determine your relationship to a printed text. Pick up a poem or a speech from a play. Look at the text printed on the page. What is the first thing you do? In 99% of first reactions to a page of print, the reader will skim quickly through to the end in order to find out what it means. That is, what the plot is and who the characters are. Why do you want to know what it means? So that you can be in control of the situation? So that you can be intelligent about the content? So that you can immediately make some decisions about how to speak the text? Your head rules. Your head tells you that it is dangerous not to know. You are in the grip of linear habit. Linear reading will give you rational information, with maybe a hint of underlying forces. As an actor, however, you must redirect your energies and demand that what comes off the page goes vertically down into the well of your psyche to mingle with the underground rivers of your unconscious mind. How to arrest the linear habit. Think of the words on the page of a script as seeds. Think of your body mind as fertile ground. Let the seeds of the words impregnate you. Give them time to gestate, to germinate. When they become full of the desire to be alive, to be spoken, allow them to be born again in words. Words must drop down into the solar and sacral centers to become images, feelings, intimations, intentions, descriptions, memory, potential, action, energy. These swirling forces merge with breath and the inner reactions and impressions are focused into impulse and the need to speak. Breath becomes vibration. Internal screams of consciousness find the order of words. The mouth answers the need to articulate, and the embodied language expresses a truth that is born from the marriage of the printed words with the speaker. I know that this is a convoluted description of a process that we take for granted. We can all read, but what I am asking here is, what kind of conditioned reading are we engaged in? Horizontal, linear reading will keep us within the safe confines of our, own, of our controlling, inventive forebrains. Vertical reading will, give us, will lead us to the crea- into the creative chaos of unpredictable responses from sensory, emotional, and physical landscapes of being and biography. The forebrain will keep us safe, but safety and comfort are the refugee of the creative coward. The actor must crave insecurity the unknown, the uncharted boundaries of the imagination, because traveling along that edge leads to the promised land of creativity. Rehabilitating reading. When we talk, we are not aware that we are seeing what we say as images. The images run by too quickly. The image has become impulse. We say to ourselves or someone else, I wonder if I had time to run to the supermarket for some milk before I go. I'll pick up the laundry on my way home. I'll just have time to feed the cats before going out to meet. All of these are mundanely informal, informational, yet all have images attached. I have students who say they are not visually oriented. They are oral or tactile. But given these small daily events to dwell on, they recognize what image is and 
can develop the visual sense to balance the other. More, distract, more abstract discussion is still imagistic. I'm feeling really down today. I don't know what to do. Everything seems pointless. In a logical extension from this familiar mood to the equally familiar existential question, what is the meaning of life? Images abound in impressionistic embraces of color and shape. Mood and emotion, sensation and action are all registered in the organism in a stream of images. When we talk, we have some purpose behind what we say. When we study a text, we must think beneath the obvious purpose of the word to the underlying need, the personal, character-driven desire that is initially experienced in images. We must slow down and the, the whole process so that we imprint the psyche, the organism, slowly and painstakingly with the images that preceded the words. Once those images have been planted, impulses are born. Words spring forth again. If the planting has been true, then the words will be spoken as truth. The actor will no longer see the images they have so painstakingly imprinted on their psyche. The body-mind mechanism is set in motion, and the impulses automatically fire the involuntary voice and speech musculature. The truth of the result depends on the depth of the planting. The planting can be deepened by using the anatomical and inner landscape pictures with which you are now familiar. How to rehabilitate reading. When you are first learning lines, do not use the word memorize. It has a busy, fast, utilitarian ring to it, and memorization tends to use photographic memory from, of text. In your mind's eye, you know if you are at the top or the bottom of the page, even when the page is turned. You tend to set up a kind of teleprompter, TM, just behind and above your eyes that, in effect, you read. This method of learning very quickly imprints speaking inflections that become hard to eradicate. The speaking becomes mechanical and devoid of human content. The old-fashioned term, learn by heart, tells you what you need to be doing when you learn. You need to absorb the words of the character you are playing into your inner landscape. You need to be breathing the words in so that the underlying thoughts become feelings and the cellular makeup of the body start to rearrange itself in response. Exercise. A very simple way is by lying to start is by lying flat on your back with your script on the floor beside you. Assuming you have warmed up yourself vocally and physically, your awareness of self will be energetically alive in the lower part of your body. Lazily lift the script so that you can see a few words. Put the script down. Let the ingoing breath take the words down to the lower spaces and keep breathing naturally as the words turn into images, feelings, potential, action, mood, question, etc. When the words are no longer seen as print, speak them on an outgoing release of sound. Continue with the ensuing words. Alternating the supine position with the diagonal stretch, the semi-fetal position, the folded leaf and the banana stretch. Learn your words lying on the floor. Learn your words on an outgoing, free sound. Don't learn them in a whisper. Keep exploring images, feelings, associations. Let the words find new meanings with every repetition. Don't settle for an interpretation. Let the different positions of your body deliver up different responses to the words. Don't hold back. Let your voice out as you learn. When you are tired of the floor, shift your physical position. Speak your words in a squat, on all floor or with your head downward. Plant the words deeply as you speak them. When you eventually stand, make sure you are still dropping the words down into the middle and lower parts of your body. Move your pelvis as you speak. Bounce your pelvis as you speak. Sh bounce your shoulder blades as you speak. Shimmy, undulate, walk, jump and stretch as you speak. Don't make any decision about how the words are to be spoken. Find out what they are saying and why you are saying them. The physical shifting will help dislodge any premature interpretation while opening up the unpreconceived levels of thoughts and ideas. Throw caution to the winds and let your voice out as you think and feel your way through the text. This is pure and active research. Remember, speaking, voice, speaking involves thought-feeling impulse, the desire to speak, breath, vibration, resonance, articulation. The muscles that are engaged on the muscular, skeletal, and voluntary level 
triggered by images. Here is another way of thinking about the process of absorbing and speaking a text, a kind of mnemonic. The three M's are to be that are to be nurtured are mind, middle, mouth. These are the ideas to be stimulated. The mind, body, mind experiences. The middle, solar plexus diaphragm, sensitive to image and impulses. The mouth, the lips, tongue is equally sensitive. The lips and tongue think and feel. They do not merely articulate. The three M's to be banished are muscling, manipulation, mastication. It is all too easy to let the muscles take over. When they do, they kidnap the truth. Believe me or else, I'm telling you loud and clear, you gotta believe me. In real life, the muscles very often get involved in emotional expression, expression to the point that the muscular experience says, anger is the tightening of the fists and shoulders and the clenching of jaw, the bunching up of the stomach muscles. Grief is the clamped down in the throat, the contortion of face muscles, the constriction in the chest. But such muscle behavior is most often the habitual response to emotion that has developed, in fact, from suppression of emotion. When a performance demands free expression of emotion, the actor's subsequent fight to get past the habitual suppression creates extra muscle work. The effort can conceive the performer that this is really, really powerful, really effective emotional delivery. Oh, the effort can convince the performer that this is really, really powerful, really effective emotional delivery. True emotion rides on the wind of breath and on sound waves reverberating through the magnifying caverns of the inbuilt resonators of the body. Obviously, muscles are strongly involved in the expression of strong muscles. A two-year-old in the grip of a tantrum is proof of that. But there is a big difference between emotional energy moving through those muscles and being held in them. There is a graphic difference between the difference in authenticity when those muscles are stimulated powerfully from inside out rather than grasping, manipulated, and actively wielding the power. To play eight performances a week, the artist who is portraying emotion must know how the flow of such energies go through the body. The performer who photocopies the everyday neural displacement of emotional expression will quickly succumb to exhaustion and strain. Some specific observations about text in their own right. Clearly, there is no one simple rule that can serve to illuminate and bring to life the, all texts in all place. Different periods, different geography, different societies are captured in different textual styles and require different approach, differing approaches. For example, the work you undertake to, just, to do justice to Shakespeare's text is specialized. You must understand how to absorb an English that is 400 years younger than the English we speak today. You must learn how to read the meaning from clues encoded in figures of speech, the um, iam, iambic pentameter and its regularities, and the structures of verse and prose. All of this with in the context of an Elizabethan world picture. There are many books that will provide detailed information you need to enter the, into the Shakespearean adventure. My own book, Freeing Shakespeare's Voice, The Actor's Guide to Talking the Text, is one of them. Plays that come under the heading of classical, from the Greeks to Shakespeare, du Boisicult, use heightened language and very often poetry to convey the heightened experience of epic stories. The storytelling is in the words. The performance relies on dramatic enactment of language through strongly dele delineated characters. The information is on the surface of the page. Modern drama is usually said to begin with Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov. Here, the English-speaking actor must struggle with translations, but also with the fact that they must enter the realm of subtext. Language is still heightened and often poetic, but the characters' live, inner lives drive the action more than the story they reveal in words. Shakespeare's dictum in Hamlet Act 3, Scene 2, suit the action to the word and the suit the action to the word, the word to the action, is perfectly advised for playing the classics. But he goes on to say, with this special observance that 
you overstep not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from per the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of this time of the time his form and pressure impression. This qualification leads us from the mandate for theatre in Shakespeare's time to our mandate for modern drama, contemporary drama, and whatever may come in the future. Ibsen and Chekhov were holding their mirrors up to their time, which was beginning to reveal psychological and personal dramas, a split-level existence that had gone unacknowledged and unrecognized in earlier times. The label modern spreads from Ibsen's to playwrights such as George Bernard Shaw, Arthur Miller, and Tennessee Williams. Their words delve into the subtrata of society and relationships, and also give the people whose lives they chronicle rich language with which to express their conflicts and desires. Language is still a component of identity in modern drama. When today's playwrights hold the looking and listening mirror up to contemporary nature, they reflect a society that has lost its language identification tag. In film and television, language is very often the tip of the iceberg as far as character is concerned. Words can be mere signposts to where the action is. In the theater, music and technology in theater, music and technology and soundscapes and special effects often do what words did in the past. Conflict, which is the lifeblood of the theater, may well now manifest itself as dissociation, a human being's life-saving ability to remove him or herself from extreme pain. The language of the dissociation may be eloquent and often verbose, but it floats above a hidden life. Today's actors must dig into the subsoil of today's stage inhabitants to tap motivation and action, the energy comes from under and behind the words. It is subverbal, infraverbal, paraverbal. The contemporary voice is, in general, a restricted voice, and the everyday range of sounds used by English speakers is small. Four or five notes may well suffice for most verbal communication. The fact that three or four octaves of speaking notes are available, that they are capable of expressing the full gamut of human emotion and all the nuances of thought, and yet that they are hardly ever used in evidence, is evidence of how much we, in Western society, suppress what we are thinking and feeling. Listening to these labels, contemporary, modern, classical, we may hear that modern voice was less adversely influenced by technological communication systems than our contemporary voices are, and more positively influenced by social systems that fostered vocal communication, family meals, singing and recitation as homegrown entertainment, open-air speeches and political debates, storytelling, education that encouraged learning poems and speaking them individually or in chorus, and a respect for, even a veneration for, of literature. The range of the power of voices were central to the life of a community. Listening into classical texts, we can hear how free and wide-ranging classical voice was. The huge stories told by the Greeks call for huge vocal and emotional capacity. The stories can only be told in poetic language that treads on the skirts of melody and trips into chant or song whenever the choruses carry the tale. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Johnson, Wester and Ford in England, Moliere, Racine and Corneille in France, Gozzi and Tasso in Italy, and de Calderon in Spain give evidence of European societies that were lavish in their expenditure of language and vociferously well equipped to celebrate the expense. Well nourished by a diet of songs, poems and stories still rooted in a thousand year old oral tradition, all classes of society exercise the full range of voice for practical purposes. In the fields and cottages, women and men called, cajoled, wailed and wassailed. In the streets of the cities, they hawked their wares at full volume. In schools and universities, men's and boys recited their lessons in stately Latin according to the rules of rhetoric. John Donne, whose sermons fill the Cathedral of St. Paul's to capacity, is said to have, a, 
had a voice that rose and reverberated round the great dome and it was heard by the overflow crowd clustered outside among the surrounding gravestones. Ship captains threw their voices up with the wind into the sails where ship boys tugged at ropes. Armies were lashed into battle by the tongue by the tongues of their leaders. Kings and queens, noblemen and women harangued their subjects with a forceful eloquence that made good use of the melodious range that their voices exercised daily by singing motets and madrigals and canons and cansonets. Cansonets. I have no doubt that the ring and range of these voices can still be heard if we, if we learn to listen well. This is the classical range of voice. We need to cultivate a kind of imaginative time and space travel machine with built-in listening centers, sensors that can pick up the ancestral voices. The imagination must be fed by reading historical research, but then it must trust its own ethereal ears and eyes. There is a charming, a charming story told about Guglielmo Marsilni, the physicist who invented radio telegraphy, telegraphy and the short wave wireless. His discovery of electromagnetic wave technique forms the basis of nearly all modern radio functions. Perhaps this is an apocryphal tale, but it serves as a good stimulus for the historical imagination. In his old age, he died in 1937, he was asked whether he was still engaged in new research. Of course, he answered. He was asked what was occupying his scientific interest at this point in his life. He answered that, based on the fact that sound waves never end but continue forever out into the universe, he was working on the development of technologies that could tune into words and that had been, spoke that had been spoken in the past. What words, in particular, from centuries of speech would you like to hear? Was the next question. His answer was, the Sermon on the Mount. Perhaps our ancestors' voices are still surfacing the eternal billows. Perhaps Jesus is yet blessing the poor, for they shall inherit the earth. There are those who say that our ancestral memory is stored in the limbic region of the brain. One way or another, we have the ability to tune into the past, and the words of classical texts provide reliable probes for the actor to deploy in the search for sounds of past voices. Within these very broad categories of dramatic texts, classical, modern, and contemporary, there are all sorts of variations and exceptions to the categorical, categorical rule. The distinctions are intended to serve as general guidelines to more specific examination. Tuning into the text. Imagination. At this juncture in your approach to understanding a text, you will be enlisting the intellect as a guide. The intellect can provide a kind of checklist for the investigative imagination. What are you listening for? Have you covered this angle or that? Are you sure you know why you're saying these words? The intellect must not, however, be allowed to be an autocrat. The intellect guides the imagination to impulse, con emotion, sensation, and sound, and it has a powerful responsibility if it is not either to be drowned in emotion or to rise up in self-defense and stifle anarchic impulses. It must mold all the emerges from the creative source into shapes that have sense and meaning. Initially, the intellect can whisper suggestions in your ear that guide your explorations. Ultimately, it is a conduit, not a controller. Here are now are some ways to sensitize your textual antenna. 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 Once you have worked with the reference to this checklist often enough, you will automatically read any text with an ear for it, its particular style and content. These checkpoints straddle the border between text and acting, but they can and should be part of an actor's homework of a text before interacting with others in the rehearsal process. Checklist. Transitions. Though thought Transitions, transitions in the subject matter, transitions in argument, transitions in the activity. The six eternal questions. Who, where, when, what, why, how. The five P's. Personal, psychological, professional, political, philosophical. Dynamics. Dynamics of the text. Dynamics of the character. Dynamics of the event. Rhythm. Rhythm of speech, rhythm of character, rhythm of the scene. 
What are transitions? Transitions are thought changes that are often signaled by words such as if, but, or, though, and always by punctuation. Transitions are emotional shifts. Transitions are shifts of direction in the action. What are the six eternal questions? One, who? Who is initially answered by the five Ps? And then it is answered by to whom are you talking? Who else is there? Two, where? Where asks questions such as, where are you as you speak? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? Three, when? When asks questions about the time, year, month, date, time of day or night or season, the time in relation to events. Four, what? What asks questions about the content of your speech, the content of the argument, the events? Five, why? Why asks questions about your motive? Why are you saying what you are saying? The first four questions also help you discover motive. Why also asks why you should use the particular words you do. The character could simply have said X, but chose to say Y. Six, how. How asks questions about tactics and strategies. Psychological, behavioral, and physical. What are the five P's? One, personal. Personal facts are all of those about the speaker's life, age, gender, ethnicity, family situation, tall, short, fat, thin, educated, or not, etc. Two, psychological. Psychological facts tell us whether a person is happy, depressive, aggressive, melancholic, and what childhood experiences inform the personality along with other formative personality experiences. Three, professional. Professional tell, facts tell what position the person holds in society, how they earn a living, for instance. Four, political. Political facts explain with what political contexts they live. Where, does, where do they belong in the socioeconomic structure? Is the character involved or not involved in politics, etc. Five, philosophical. Philosophical facts are those such as religious or not religious, believes in God or does not, follows a spiritual practice of any kind, research, searches for existential meaning, animist, lives only from day to day, etc. What are the components of dynamic? Pace is a component, component of dynamic. Uh, fast, faster, slow, slower, somewhere in between fast and slow. Pitch is a component of dynamics, high, higher, low, lower, middle of the range. Volume is a component of dynamics, loud, louder, soft, softer, mid volume. What are the components of rhythm? Dynamics are a component of rhythm. Emphasis is a component of rhythm and involves strong emphasis juxtaposed with a weak emphasis. Regularity, irregularity, syncopation are all components of rhythm. Rhythm, dynamics, and transitions all depend for artistic execution on the person's well-developed sensitivity to contrast. The actor must know the answers to the six eternal questions and those posed by the five Ps. The actor must be the master of all the information even though the character may not know nearly as much. I repeat the point I made earlier. These checkpoints straddle the border between text and acting, but they can and should all be part of an actor's first encounter with the text when they are alone, before interacting in a rehearsal process. Once the private work has created its own harmonic reservoir of fact and fancy, association, memory, motive, music and rhythm, it can then meet, mingle and optimize with the fresh ingredients coming from others. Applying this long ch checklist may seem laborious, but with practice, the repetition of labor, with practice, the repetition of labor, the intellect extends its centripetal awareness and reads with greater breadth and depth. The haiku. I am going to use one particular kind of poetic text for a demonstration of how to use the ideas of I, I have outlined. I hope this illustration will act as a guide for work on other texts. If I were to give, try to give examples of how to approach two, three, or twenty different styles of writing, 
I would have to cover them all, which would be impossible within the limits of this book. The haiku is a perfect miniature gymnasium for exercising one's text talents. The basic attributes of a good haiku are that within 17 syllables, there are at least three images that arouse three different emotional responses. I only use haiku that have been anointed in as classical as in the Japanese tradition. This means that we must use translations and in English the 17 syllable rule yields often to an accurate expression of feeling and image. I work with haiku be because so much happens within so few words that classroom time is used in a very economical way. I use classic haiku because they have stood the test of time and are packed with power. They are emotionally and psychologically potent and they only work when the speaker is ready to be acted upon, not actively doing. They are thus good, compact text and acting exercises. The other great lesson the haiku teaches is that to enter the truth, you must imagine the author. You cannot speak them without joining with the poet on some imaginative plane. The origin of haiku writing is lost in Japanese antiquity antiquity but the golden age of haiku arrived in the 17th and 18th centuries i have chosen five from this period they are to be found in an introduction to haiku an anthology of poems and poets from abashu to shiki the translation and invaluable commentary are by harold g henderson henderson says this of bashu who is considered the great classic maker of haiku Consciously or unconsciously, Basho put in most, if not all, of his latter haiku all the meaning that anyone can find and probably more. The more one reads them, the more one finds depth in each single one, even in those that seem most trivial. trivial. Once gets, one gets the feeling that there are somehow all parts of one whole. Japanese who have had the same experience have explained it by saying that Basho was so imbued with the spirit of Zen that it could not help showing in everything he wrote. It is quite possibly true, but as an explanation it suffers from the fact that nobody has yet to be able to define what the spirit of Zen actually is. Zen illumination, Satori, is apparently a strong emotional experience for which there are no words. It has been called a Realizing of reality, all about that non-Zen people, about all that non-Zen people can do is observe its effect on Basho and on his poems. Among the qualities which are often considered as indicative of his Zen are a great zest for life, a desire to use every instant to its utmost, to its utmost, an appreciation of this even in natural objects. A feeling that nothing alone, nothing unimportant, and an acute awareness of relationships of all kind, including that one sense to another. What follows is a painstakingly examination of what it takes to bring life, breath, and presence to a text, in this case a haiku, and thus eludicate the, its meaning. Once you understand the process, it goes quite fast. In order to understand, though, I must lead you through the process at a snail's pace. The poets who wrote the following five haiku are, respectively, Onitsura, 1660 to 1738, Soto, 1641 to 1716, Bashu's pupil, Yoso, 1661 to 1704, Isa, 1762 to 1826, and Basho himself, 1644 to 1694. Step 1. Please copy each of these haiku onto a separate sheet of paper in capital letters and with a large space between each line. Make two copies of each. Green fields of grain, a skylark rises. Over there, comes down again. My hut it my hut is in my hut in spring true there is nothing in it there is everything i've just been to the lake bottom that is the look on the little duck's face 
a man just one, also a fly just one, in the huge living room. Clouds come from time to time and give to men a chance to rest from looking at the moon. Step two, haiku number one. Green fields of grain, a skylark, skylark rises, over there comes down again. Arrest your linear habit. Tear the poem up so that your each word is torn away from its neighbor. You will have a small pile of scraps of paper, each one with word, each with one word on it. Lie down on that floor. Pick up a scrap of paper randomly. Hold it above your face so that you can see the word on it. Let the word go deep into your body with your breath. Let it turn to image or emotion or action or abstract shape. Give the images time and space to grow and become vivid. Put the paper down so that you are no longer reading it. Let the feeling that comes from the imagined word inhabit your breath and generate the vibrations of sound. Let the imagination in your body come into the word as you speak it. Let the energy of the sound and the images activate your body as you speak the word. Continue with each word individually until the pile of paper is finished. Let each word enter you, your breath, and the touch of sound more than once so that you really see it, taste it, touch it, and find its meaning. Step 3. Take your second copy of the haiku and tear each line away from the other. Lie down on the floor and let each group of words enter into your body and imagination by a way of your breath. Let the group create new pictures, pictures that are made vivid because you have already imagined the words separately. Now that they are related to one another, they form something new. Let the pictures turn into words. As, they separate, as the separate lines gather energy from your imagination and from the feelings triggered by the images, let them bring you up to standing. Let your body be activated by the images. Continue to be passive physically as you enhance the details. The lines are now in the right order. Green fields of grain. Be scrupulous in the accuracy of your image. The color. More than one field. Not grass, but grain. Green grain tells you something about the season. Late spring, summer. Stay with the image of the fields. Know how you feel. Now let the next image happen. A skylark rises. The image changes. The feeling changes. This is a transition. Be accurate in the image. A skylark is a small bird with vertical takeoff and an ecstatic song. Over there. The distance has significance and qualifies the feeling of the previous image. This is another transition on a smaller scale. Stay with that image, know how you feel. Let the next image happen. Comes down again. What is the feeling that comes with this new image? Register the emotional transition. Step four. This is not just a pretty nature poem. The poet's observation of a specific moment in nature comes from the perspective of his emotional and psychological state of being at the time. A significant moment of being heightens perception. The heightened language of poetry illuminates the scene and the feeling behind it. The speaker's task is to enter that first creative moment and deduce the poet's inner state. Then the speaker must resuscitate the moment by finding an equivalent state of being in his or her own life. In order to find the poet's creative moment, you must turn to the six eternal questions and the five piece. Not necessary, all of them will be relevant. One, let the image... Sorry. Let the images happen again with thought-feeling transitions. Practice seeing them simultaneously outside and inside your body. Outside gives the actual scene, inside leads the emotional significance. Two, picture the poet in his time and place in relation to the images. Who? Who, who is he or she? Where? In the fields? Standing at the door of a house? When? What time of day? What time of year? What? What is going on in the poet's life right at that moment? Why? 
Why does the poet suddenly perceive the fields and the skylark in such a way that a haiku must be written? Three. Now put yourself in the scene in the place of the poet. Find an equivalent view that you know or an imaginary one. Ask yourself the same questions. Four. The five piece will help flesh out answers both for the poet and for yourself. For example, what age is the poet? How old am I? Personal. Why are we on the, out in the countryside? Psychological. A feeling of youth and promise comes with the picture of the young grain. A stab of in A stab of excitement comes as the lark erupts out of the field. Something thrilling will happen soon in my life. But it is a long way off. As the skylark descends, so does my hope. Professional. This promise, this hope, and this subsequent disappointment are familiar in the ups and downs of my professional life. I am always falling in love and then falling out again. Is the poet's professional or personal life that is it the poet's professional or personal life that is the background for this haiku? And mine? Political. This could have a political story behind it, but I think that would be a red herring, so I will ignore the political. Philosophical. The poet and I know, both know that the life is full of expectations and delusion, disillusion, and we know that each experience of this is as fresh as the first time. Step five. Now that there is some content that needs to be expressed, the speaker can become gently aware of how the images and feelings change. In other words, the speaker can look for the dynamics that are intrinsic to those images and feelings. Be careful, though, in expressing these transitions. There is a danger that the intellect will hear interesting dynamics and apply them, Faster here, higher there, slower and quieter to finish. If the intellect dictates the dynamic, the resulting expression will be dead. 5. Dynamics Green fields of grain. With all the content of the previous works, these words need a bit of amplitude. They will probably emerge with some weight, and quite slowly. A skylark rises. The speed of the act Ascent sparks a voice into a different energy from green fields. The voice may go a little higher, the words may come faster. Over there. The distance, the remoteness, the sounds of the vowels all make the delivery slower. The words perhaps stretch a little, perhaps go lower in pitch. Comes down again. The feeling drops and the voice drops with it. The heavy beat of comes down. It's like a, that of a bass drum. Again, trips the final thump of meaning. Rhythm. The rhythms of the haiku emerge from the innate qualities within the dynamics of image, feeling, and word. Be aware also that in this haiku, nearly every word has a strong emphasis and that all among the 16 syllables, there are only five weak syllables. Step six, speak the haiku. Experience the three emotional shifts that come in reaction to the three major image shifts. Step seven, haiku number two. My hut in spring, there, true, there is nothing in it. There is everything. Follow the same process for the, as for the first haiku. Tear the words apart from one another. Absorb them into your reservoir of images, emotions, and actions. Speak each one with the imagination embodied in the word as you speak. Tear the lines away from one another. Absorb them. Let them activate your body as they release out of you. Put the lines in the right order. As you see and speak the images, practice seeing them simultaneously outside and inside your body. Outside the actual scene, inside leads to the emotional significance. Go through the six questions and the five piece. Commentary. At this point, a student will often come up with a picture that is personal but inaccurate. It might be a picture of a beach cottage that is sparsely furnished. In this case, there is everything. Means, but that's quite okay. But the personal must give way to the poet's word. 
It is a hut and it has nothing in it. The speaker must begin to use the imagination and see not a log cabin in the Adirondacks with Ikea furniture, but a bare hut. The first speaking of the haiku can often leave students baffled and thinking, so what? The words are flat and the facts are not very interesting. But a poet wrote these words and his relationship to this hut must become the students if they are to understand the haiku's meaning. If the hut is really a bear hut and they can and they accept that they own it, they can start to imagine where it is, what it looks like, and why they own it, and ask questions about their relationship to it. The significance of spring is easy to ignore, yet the poet sees his hut suddenly made vivid by that season of the year. And so I, too, at the mention of spring, must evoke that image that tactly tacitly tact tacitly sets it against the other seasons. Perhaps in winter the hut is closed up because it's too cold to inhabit. By the time summer comes, I become used to it and hardly look at it when I go in. In the fall, I find that it gets damp and chilly. But spring reminds me of everything I love about the solitude of my time in my hut. It seems pretty clear that I don't invite other people to my hut. What about nothing and everything? Is it the solitude, the silence that makes up the nothing? What happens to me when I am alone and silent in my hut? And then, in spring, do I smell the blossoms and feel the breeze? Do I find myself thinking, I am content, I am full, this is everything? From the five Ps, we need to draw on the philosophical for deeper levels of this haiku. If my hut is, in fact, me, then it is possible that I am finding a way to express those moments when I renew my spirit, and in meditation come to a state of nothingness that opens into a profound sense of self and fulfillment. Speak the haiku, going from specific image to specific image, letting each image find its specific, specific emotional, personal response. Let reverberations from the past, from the poet's inspiration, resound. Step 8. Haiku number 3. I've just been to the lake bottom. That is the look on the little duck's face. Follow the same process as for the first and second haikus. Your inner ear and your eye should be hearing and seeing more as you continue. Compare your reading with my example below. Mine is not necessarily correct, but it may open up responsibilities for you to explore. I've just been. I've been somewhere, but I don't know how to describe it. To the lake bottom. My equivalent of the lake bottom is a dark world of wonder, or some fabulous trip or fantasy, or, by contrast, a sense of drowning in a pit of despair. That is the look on the little duck's face. I envision a little duck dived down for the first time to the bottom of the lake and has just surfaced, shaking drops of water from its head and looking around with pride and the delight of, Aha! I survived! I see the poet plunged in gloom, wading along the edges of the lake. Suddenly, the duckling breaks up through the water. It looks quite surprised. It looks as if it, as if it is smiling, laughing. The poet feels a weight lift from his heart and says, But I'm alive, I survive. The rhythms are choppy. Lake's bottom, little duck, that is on the... Echoing the splashing duck movements with sharp k and t -s. Step 9. Haiku number 4. A man just one. Also a fly just one. In the huge living room. Follow the same process as before. The more transitions you find, the better. For instance, a man is the first image. When you add just one, the image is modified into something a little odd, maybe even slightly menacing. Balanced with the, first, with the next image, a fly, just one, the oddity grows. Don't run these phrases together. Feel the tension between the contrasting image and the repetition of just one. 
explore the scene with the questions of where you are and where the poet is in relationship in relation to the man and the fly are you and is the poet the man are you looking through in through the window is the living room just a living room remember there must have been a strong psychological or emotional reason for the poet to set see this scene and transform it into a haiku please do your own work on the haiku before continuing to read when i explain to you my reading of this haiku you must remember that it is not the correct reading it is mine i am struck by the amount of space in the picture by the silence broken perhaps by the buzzing of the fly but perhaps the fly is silent clinging to the wall or ceiling i see the man and the fly look at each other something about the scene pushes beyond the domestic and the huge living room suggests life itself or the word world the man and the fly now become the last living creatures will the man kill the fly or the fly kill the man this interpretation does not come from my head it gradually swims up through misty images and questions that won't settle or for immediate or comfortable answers extremes start to become active attractive a haiku that has lasted for three or more centuries was conceived in some kind of extremity otherwise the potency of the images would have faded this is the text groundwork for actors it must become familiar turf before moving into the more complex territory of performance you must be able to experience emotional imagination in the body you must be able to express the incarnated emotional imagination in words if you are to speak classical texts and poetic texts truthfully note that i say you must be able to this fullness of expression is not an aesthetic rule for classical or poetic texts once you are free from your personal limitations of expression you can choose to contain language with a variety of chosen styles of speaking step 10 haiku number five Clouds come from time to time and give men a chance to rest from looking at the moon. Clouds come from time to time. My first impression is that the clouds are grey. Dark clouds suggest moments of sadness or depression and give, the, and give to men a chance to rest. Oh, these clouds are comforting, peaceful. From looking at the moon, the clouds float across the moon in the night sky. What does the moon connote? Con cannot love madness dreams and aspirations sleeplessness i know that this is night time the, that the poet and i can't sleep we are in love or in the grip of an obsession or concocting brilliant and unlikely dreams of future glory the moon reflects our lunacy and every now and then thank heaven we remember times in the past when a disastrous love affair failed an obsession dissolved or an ambition was thwarted it, it was quite a relief really the clouds are of reality are restful but the moon comes out again from behind the clouds the obsession grips us again clouds come the rhythm is weighted and quite slow the tone rather dark from time to time this qualifies and slightly lightens the effect of the first image the vowels are brighter but still long and give to men this is a transition to the personal human world from an indifferent natural world both are on a universal scale the rhythm quickens slightly as the vowels shorten and the question what can clouds give men moves the energy forward a chance to rest chance lifts the voice a little in its hopeful potential to rest lets the voice settle gently down from looking at the moon the haiku doesn't quite finish the brightness of the moon unsettles us with its lunatic insistence the rhythm of this haiku is different from the others not only because the rhythm of the content is different but because in this one the major words are interspersed with many small short words clouds come from time to time and give to men a chance to rest from looking at the moon you are searching for meaning gazing at the moon 
you can fall in love with this poem. You might feel yourself going crazy trying to get to the bottom of it. Is the moon perhaps your voice? Is it hard to understand your voice? Are you working on a role? Searching for the character? Let the clouds come for a little. Go to sleep. Turn your mind off. Let go. Next time you look at the moon, you might suddenly really see it. Next time you speak this haiku, you might really get the feeling behind the meaning. The next time you work on your voice, it might be a whole and free and absolutely yours. Appendix, excerpted from Anatomy and Physiology of the Voice and Choral Pedagogy by Robert Sadeloff, MD, DMA. The human voice is remarkable, complex, and delicate. It is capable of conveying not only sophisticated intellectual concepts, but also subtle emotional nuances. Although the uniqueness and beauty of the human voice have been appreciated for centuries, medical science has begun to understand the workings and care of the voice only since the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Although it is not necessary to master detailed scientific information about anatomy and physiology to sing, speak, in a healthy fashion, at least a basic understanding of the structures and functions is helpful. Anatomy. What body parts make up the voice? What is the larynx? The larynx, voice box, is essential to normal voice pr production. But the anatomy of the voice is not limited to the larynx. The vocal mechanisms includes the abdominal and back musculature, the rib cage, the lungs, the pharynx, the oral cavity, and the nose. Each component performs an important function in voice production, although it is possible to produce voice even without a larynx, e.g. in parent patients who have undergone laryng laryngectomy, removal of the larynx, for cancer. In addition, virtually all parts of the body play some role in the voice production and may be responsible for voice dysfunction. Even something as remote as a sprained ankle alter posture, thereby impairing abdominal muscle function and resulting in vocal inefficiency, weakness, or hoarseness. The larynx is composed of four basic anatomic units, skeleton, intrinsic muscles, extrinsic muscles, and mucosa. The most important parts of the laryngeal skeleton are the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and the two arytenoid cartilages. Intrinsic muscles of the larynx are connected to these cartilages. One of the intrinsic muscles, the vocalis muscles, part of the thyroarytenoid muscle, extends on each side of the arytenoid cartilage on to the side to the inside of the thyroid cartilage just below and behind the Adam's apple, forming the body of the vocal folds, popularly called vocal cords. The vocal folds act as the oscillator and voice source noisemaker, of the vocal tract. The space between the vocal cords is called the glottis and is used as an anatomic reference point. The intrinsic muscles alter the position, shape, and tension of the vocal folds, bringing them together, adduction, moving them apart, abduction, or stretching them by increasing long longitudinal tension. They are able to do so because the laryngeal cartilages are connected by soft attachments that allow changes in their relative angles and distances, thereby permitting alteration in the shape and tension of the issue, tissues suspended between them. The arytenoids are also capable of rocking, rotating and gliding, which permits complex vocal fold motion and alternation in the shape of the vocal fold edge. All but one of the muscles on each side of the larynx are innervated by one or two recurrent laryngeal nerves. This structure runs a long course from the neck down into the chest and then back up to the larynx, hence the name recurrent. The remaining muscle, the cricothyroid muscle, is innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve on each side. It produces increases in long longitudinal tension important in volume projection and pitch control. The false vocal cords are located above the vocal cords. Unlike the true vocal folds, uh, they do not make contact during normal speaking or singing. What happens above the larynx? 
The supraglottic vocal tract includes the pharynx, tongue, palate, oral cavity, nose, and other structures. Together, they act as a resonator and are largely responsible for the vocal quality or timbre and the perceived character of all of speech sounds. The vocal folds themselves produce only a buzzing sound. During the course of my vo of vocal training for singing, acting, or healthy speaking, changes occur not only in the larynx, but also in the muscle motion, control, and shape of the supraglottic vocal tract. What happens below the larynx? The infraglottic vocal tract serves as the power source for the voice. Singers and actors refer to the entire power source complex as their support or diaphragm. Actually, the anatomy of support of phonation in, is especially complicated and not completely understood, and performers who use the terms diaphragm and support do not always mean the same thing. Yet it is quite important because deficiencies in support are frequently responsible for voice dysfunction. The purpose of support the purpose of the support mechanism is to generate a force that directs a controlled airstream between the vocal folds. Active respiratory muscles work together with passive forces. The principal muscles of inspiration are the diaphragm, a dome-shaped muscle that extends along the bottom of the rib cage, and the external intercostal rib muscles. During quiet breathing, expiration is largely passive. Deficiencies in the support mechanism often result in compensator compensatory efforts utilizing the laryngeal muscles, which are not designed for power source function. Physiology of the voice. How does it all work together to make a voice? What do the brain and nerves have to do with voice production? The physiology of voice production is extremely complex. Volitional production of the voice begins in the cerebral cortex of the brain. The command for vocalization involves complex interaction among brain centers for speech and other ideas. The ideas of the planned vocalization is conveyed to the precentral gyrus in the motor cortex, which transmits another set of instructions to the motor nuclei in the brain stem and spinal cord. These areas send out the complicated messages necessary for coordinated activity of the larynx, the chest and abdominal musculature, and the vocal tract articulators. Additional refinement of motor activity is provided by the extrapyramidal and autonomic nervous systems. These impulses combine to produce a sound that is transmitted not only to the ears of the listener, but also to those of the speaker or singer. Tactile feedback from the throat and muscles involved in phonation also helps in the fine-tuning of the vocal output, although the mechanism and role of tactile sense of feeling touch feedback are not fully understood. How is sound produced? Phonation, the production of sound, requires interaction among the power source, oscillators, and resonator. During phonation, the infraglottic musculature must make rapid complex adjustments because the resistance changes, resistance changes almost continuously as the glottis opens, closes, and changes shape. At the beginning of each phonatory cycle, the vocal folds are approximated and the glottis is obliterated. This permits infraglottic pressure to build up, typically to a level of about 7 centimeters of water for conversational speech. Because the vocal folds are closed, there is no airflow. The subglottic pressure then pushes the vocal folds progressively farther apart from the bottom up until a space develops and air begins to flow. Bernoulli force uh, created by the air passes between the vocal folds and combines with the mechanical properties of the folds to begin closing the lower portions of the glottis almost immediately, even while the upper edges are still separating. The principles and mathematics of the Bernoulli force are complex. It is a flow effect more easily understood by familiar examples, such as the sensation of pull exerted on a vehicle when passed by a truck at high speed or the inward motion of a shower curtain when water flows past it. The upper portion of the vocal folds has strong elastic properties to, that tend to make the vocal folds snap back to the midline. 
This force becomes more dominant as the upper edges are stretched and the opposing force of the air diminishes because of the approximation of the lower edges of the vocal folds. The upper portions of the vocal folds are then returned to the midline, completing the glottic cycle. Subglottal pressure, pressure then builds again and the events repeat. Pitch is the perceptual correlate of frequency. Under most circumstances, as vocal folds are thinned and stretched and air pressure is increased, the frequency of air pulse emission increases and pitch goes up. The sound produced by the vibrating vocal folds, called the voice source signal, is a complex tone containing a fundamental frequency and many overtone or higher harmonic partials. How is the sound shaped? The pharynx, the oral cavity, and the nasal cavity act as a series of interconnected resonators. Some resonators are attenuated and others are enhanced. The enhanced frequencies are then radiated with higher relative amplitudes or intensities. Sundberg has shown that the vocal tract has four or five important resonance frequencies called formants. The presence of formants alter the uniformly slopping voice source spectrum and creates peaks at formant frequencies. These alterations of the voice source spectral envelope are responsible for distinguishable sounds of speech and song. How do we pick how do we control pitch and loudness? The mechan mechanisms that control two vocal characteristics, fundamental frequency and intensity are particularly important. Fundamental frequency, which responds to pitch, can be altered by changing either the air pressure or the mechanical properties of the vocal folds, although changing the latter is more efficient under most conditions. When the cricothyroid mus muscle contracts, it makes the thyroid cartilage pivot and increase the distance between the thyroid and arytenoid cartilages, thus stretching the vocal folds. This increase this increases the surface area exposed to subglottal pressure and makes the air pressure more effective in opening the glottis. In addition, stretching the, stretching the elastic fibers of the vocal folds make them more efficient at snapping back together. As the cycles shorten and repeat more frequently, the fundamental frequency and pitch rise. Other muscles, including the thyroarytenoid, also contribute. Vocal intensity corresponds to loudness and depends on the, de on the degree to which the glottal wave motion excites the air molecules in the vocal tract. Raising the air pressure creates greater amplitude of vocal fold displacement from the midline and therefore increases vocal intensity. However, it is not actually the vibration of the vocal fold, but rather the sudden cessation of airflow that is responsible for initiating sound in the vocal tract and controlling intensity. This is similar to the mechanism of the acoustic vibration that results from buzzing lips. In the larynx, the sharper the cutoff of airflow, the more intense the sound. Conclusion. The vocal mechanism includes the larynx, the abdominal and back musculature, the rib cage, the lungs, the pharynx, oral cavity, and nose. Each component performs an important function in the noise production, in the voice production. The physiology of voice is extremely complex, involving interaction among brain centers for speech in other areas. Signals are transmitted to the motor nuclei of the brain, and brainstem and spinal cord. Coordin coordinating the activity of the larynx, the chest and abdominal muscles, and the vocal tract articulators. Other areas of the nervous system provide additional refinement. Formation requires interaction among the power source, oscillator, and resonator. The sound produced by the vocal folds, called the vocal source signal, is complex tone containing a fundamental frequency and many overtones. The pharynx, oral cavity, and nasal cavity act as a series of interconnected resonators. They shape sound quality and enhance audibility by creating a singer's formant. Specific anatomic adjustments control fundamental frequency and intensity. Acknowledgements 
For the 1976 edition of Freeing the Natural Voice, I gratefully acknowledge the Ford Foundation for making it possible for me to take a year away from teaching in order to write the first edition of this book. And the Rockefeller Foundation for the first five weeks they granted me at the Villa Cerebelloni where the atmosphere made writing possible. For this revised and expanded edition, I thank the Columbia University School of the Arts and Dean Bruce Ferguson for awarding me a semester's creative leave in order to revise my textbook. I gratefully acknowledge Marjorie Hanlon, Julie Sheehan, Joanna Ware, Andrea Herring and Fran Bennett for their invaluable editorial help. I remain indebted to Tom Shipp for his contribution to the description of how the voice works, which stands more or less unchanged from the 1976 edition, and to Dr. Robert Sadeloff for giving me permission to use excerpts from his writing to augment the anatomical picture. I also dedicate this edition to all the teachers of Freeing the Natural Voice who have undergone my rigorous teaching trainer, teacher training programs and who love this way of working on the human voice. Kristen Linklater, New York City, www.linklatervoice.com.